I do want to thank Pastor Birchie and Michael Best and Stafford for the opportunity to be with you tonight. It is always a privilege to open God's Word, and I've come to love this fellowship, the Sunday evening gathering. I'm the principal teacher for the In Focus community, and the word that God has given us tonight has come really from our study of the book of Acts. Everywhere we turn, it seems that people are in conflict. No matter what part of the country, people are disagreeing, there's dissension, we're divided. I want to hasten to tell you that I came by today not so much to describe the temperature of the water that's around us, but I really came by tonight to encourage you. And you say, well, Pastor, you're talking about how much discord there is and how much division exists and how much dissension there is. That, that doesn't sound very encouraging. Well, I agree with you. Stay with me for a minute. When we turn our attention to the book of Acts tonight for some guidance on conflict resolution, we're going to look and take a close look at how the early Christians had to come to terms with some very serious conflict. It was so serious, in fact, it threatened to divide the church. I submit to you that if you're looking for a place to start with a personal Bible study, that the book of Acts is a great place to start. It's sometimes referred to as the act of the apostles, but I think a better title for it would be the act of the Holy Spirit. Because this is full of the enabling of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it was written by the physician Luke, and Luke gives great detail in his writings. Great historical detail, factual details, but he says these things in that kind of understated physician way. You know, when you talk to a doctor, how they just kind of say, you have a compound fracture proximal to the patella and distal to the, what's going on? Your leg is jacked up. But they say it in such a calm way. It's like the commercials that are on TV. Do you watch them? And they'd say, you take this stuff, take JoJo. It'll help you with your warts. Now, the side effects for JoJo are blindness, mental illness. You go, oh, wait, wait. I, I, I'm going to keep the wart. I don't want to. So he tells us these incredible things that are going on, but he says it in just this kind of matter of factly manner. Like he says, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives and he ascends into heaven. He just says it. I don't know how you would describe that. That's not something that happens every day. There's somebody just ascends into heaven and the clouds take them up, but he says, Jesus is on the Mount. He just ascends into heaven. And this is where Acts kind of picks up with Jesus ascending into heaven. So many interesting things in Acts that I could encourage you to, to do. You know, there was a time when the scholars said, well, there's no way that Luke could have been an eyewitness to these things. And that was because in Luke 17, he made reference in verse 8 to a title, Poltiarchs. And the scholar said, uh-uh, no way he could have been a contemporary of that time because there was no such title. The verse itself, you'll miss it if you read it, in 17.8 simply says, rulers of citizens or rulers of the city, but the translation of it is the Poltiarchs. And so they're going, there's no Poltiarchs. What is he talking about? There's no way that Luke could have been a contemporary of that time because there was no such title then. Until 1863, when they unearthed an arch, and on that arch was a plaque. And on the plaque, it was dedicated to the six Poltiarchs of the time. The Bible is 100% reliable, and every bit of archaeology confirms that. They dig things up that are told about in this passage of real people doing real things in real time, and the book of Acts is full of it, and we can be encouraged by that tonight because we can trust the Bible. In Acts, we find what happens the first time in history now is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Oh, this is so exciting. Up to this point, the Holy Spirit would come upon people and enable them to do tasks for God. Samson, 
Saul, the first king, but the Holy Spirit would leave them. Now, at the day of Pentecost, something miraculous happens for every believer. The Holy Spirit now indwells us. And it was confirmed by this miraculous event of them speaking in tongues, the glaciolalia, where they were talking in languages that they never learned, and people were hearing it and understanding it, confirming that the Holy Spirit was there. Perhaps they'll have me back at some time. I can't linger tonight about tongues, but perhaps I can come back at some time and we can spend some time talking about that gift of tongues and whether it exists today in the contemporary church. But we should be encouraged because Jesus promised a paraclete, one like him, that he would come, and we see that in the book of Acts. It's in Acts that Peter preached his first sermon, and after his first sermon, 3,000 people came to saving faith. I preached my first sermon. It was to myself. I liked it. Peter preached his first sermon. 3,000 people came to saving faith. Miraculous things like this. It's in the book of Acts that we learn of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Now, Saul was a Pharisee. You know what? That's really going to become important to the text that we're going to look at in just a minute, so I need somebody to help me remember that. Somebody with a loud voice in here. Any men here with a nice loud voice want to admit it? Any handsome men? Godly, handsome men. Okay, this is rough, rough house, rough crowd. <laughs> That's all right, I'm just going to pick on somebody. A godly man like Elder Tom Sawyer sitting up here close at hand. Hi, hi, Elder Sawyer. So can you help me remember this bit of information that Saul slash Paul was a Pharisee? Yeah. Say yes. Yes. Just fine, Okay. You can get permission from your wife if you have to. Ask, is it okay for him to do that for me? Okay. So you'll remind us later about that. And just by way of background, to put it, yeah, you can remind. So what was Paul? Was there we go. You got people helping you over here with this. This is good. At this time in the story, there are two main political parties, so to speak, that would have managed the Sanhedrin. There was a third, but the two main bodies were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were aristocratic. They were the wealthy priests, people of rank. They only recognized the written law, so anything verbal didn't carry a lot of weight with them. But the principal thing, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the body. So that puts them now on an irreconcilable course with the gospel. If you don't believe Jesus came out of the grave, then we're here for no reason at all, right? So because they didn't believe in the resurrection, that's what made them sad, you see. <laughs> Pharisees, they believed that God would send a Messiah. He'd bring peace to the world, and he'd rule in Jerusalem. And our friend, Saul, was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was a prized student of one of the greatest rabbis of that time. And in the book of Acts, we see how he comes to saving faith. This is an incredible story. Saul had gotten the equivalent of a warrant to go and hunt out Christians because he was a, he was a Pharisee. And so he's on his way to Damascus to do just that, to go hunt down some of these people in the way, and he is going to physically drag them back, arguably, for execution in Jerusalem. And it's Jesus himself that brings him to saving faith. Now, I wish I could linger here, but I just want to put some context and hopefully excite you about this book of Acts. What I find encouraging about this is that if God can forgive a murderous ex-Pharisee like Saul, not only can he forgive him, but he can transform him. He can give him a new name and a new nature and use him for his glory. I have enough hope to believe that God can save anybody. 
You ought to be encouraged by that tonight. In Acts, the mystery of the church is revealed. The gospel message is preached to the Gentiles. We can get excited about that. That's us, the Gentiles. And in the text that we're going to look at shortly, 10 years prior to this time, Peter gets called to Caesarea by a centurion named Cornelius. And it's there while he's meditating that he has this revelation directly from God. A sheet comes down from heaven and it has all manner of unclean meat in it. And it says, rise up Peter, slay and eat. And he says, I can't eat that, I'm a Jew. And God tells him, what I've declared clean, don't you dare call unclean. The message that he's giving him there is that now the gospel message that you've been preaching to the Jews is fully available to the Gentiles as well. This sheet comes down from heaven, and in the sheet, you've got pork chops and ribs and rib tips and polar sausages and bacon and big old pieces of sausage. And all he needed was some sweet baby rays, and he would have been set to go. So what starts to happen? Gentiles are getting converted. And the church is growing. And that brings us to our text. If you look in your handout, and I was looking at it before I came up here, <coughs> there's actually a typo because there is no Jesus in the beginning of 15.1. The text actually starts but some men came down from Judea. You with me? All right. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This is dangerous. They're not talking about adhering to just Jewish custom. They're saying that circumcision is now a part of your salvation. And unless you are circumcised and adhering to the Mosaic law, salvation is outside the grasp of the Gentiles. Now this is contrary to everything that Peter and Paul have been teaching. Historically, if someone wanted to be a worshiper of the true God, they would have to be circumcised. We find that teaching from Exodus, Exodus 12, 48. And so you would have Gentiles that would worship the true living God, and that was part of what they'd have to undergo. And so this isn't uncommon for them to raise this, but all of the signs to this point had shown unequivocally that Gentiles were participating in the same salvation that the Jews were receiving. How? Because they were speaking in tongues. They were getting baptized. And they were hearing the simple message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus with nothing added. So we got a conflict. And there, beloved, is what was then convened in 48 AD, what is called the Jerusalem Council. The text tells us that they assembled now, this, had, this debate went on. What had happened, they're now in Syrian Antioch, which is about 300 miles from Jerusalem. Men had come from Jerusalem and gone to Antioch to say, you know, this whole thing about the Gentiles is wrong. They can't really be saved unless they're going to follow the Mosaic law. They can't really be saved unless they are circumcised. Now Jerusalem church was made up primarily of believing Jews. We know from the text that they were Pharisees. That's in verse 5. Verse 1 says some men. Verse 5 says, and these were men who were Pharisees. Well, how interesting. Because one of the men in Antioch that is going to be part of this discussion is a guy who used to be a Pharisee. And that was, what's his name? Okay, thank you. <laughs> How interesting. 
that God would choose to save a former Pharisee among Pharisees for such a time as this to be able to talk to his brethren and communicate with them the truth of the gospel. You have Pharisees that are raising the argument, and we have a converted Pharisee who's in the midst of this argument, and he would carry this torch in his arguments in Galatia and others. But Peter and Barnabas are selected. They're going to go back, and they're going to go to Jerusalem to seek some counsel. Interesting. Look at verse 3, if you would. So, being sent on the way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. And that brought great joy to all the brothers. The point that I wanted to make for you here is that, that characterization. So, being sent on the way by the church. It's easy to miss that when we read it, but it's really a term of art. It's an expression that's used not only in the Bible, but in other literature, and it denotes far more than just saying goodbye to somebody. When you read it initially, you kind of get the impression they just said, bye, send you on your way, have a nice trip, see you when you get back, but that's not what really is meant here. When it says they were sent on the way, it involved provision for the journey. It involved arrangements for security. It involved overnight stops for sleep and for food. There would have been prayer as they departed and there would have been the promise of faithful intercessory prayer until they returned. When I read the passage, I think about our missionaries and how we send them on their way. And I thank God for David Zuperkew and our Global Outreach Committee and the missionaries that we send all over the world because they go under great intercessory prayer and with mindful thought and an intentional thought regarding how they're going to get there along the way and where they will live and what they will have. The passage tells us that the delegation from Antioch is politely received in Jerusalem and then, beloved, it's on. If you look at the text, verses 6 and 7, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider the matter. And after there had been a little debate, is that what Jura says? What, what does Jura say? And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and he said to them, there's much wisdom we can glean now from this passage, and that's what I want to spend just a few minutes with you about, is that when we find ourselves in conflict, there are some keys that are presented in this passage on how we can resolve them within the body of Christ. And what we need to hasten to remind ourselves is that this was a conflict among people who professed to be believers. Maybe we should step back a step and simply ask, is there going to be conflict within the body of Christ? That's a question. I'll wait. Absolutely. Or that is, just because we are saved, does that mean we're all going to get along? No. In fact, some of you aren't getting along with people right now. You have all the attractive people sitting on one side of the room, and all, I'm not going to tell you which side is which. No. <laughs> Conflict! <laughs> so what can we glean from here when there will be conflict? Number one, and this is kind of axiomatic, but we have to say it, number one is simply admit that there is a problem. You don't ignore it. The Jerusalem church and the Gentile believers in Antioch were separated by over 300 miles. Now, even by today's standards, that's a fair piece. This is a long way in this time. There were no Ubers. Closest thing to an Uber would have been a camel named Uber. <laughs> there were no trains. 
no cars. You were going to walk wherever you got, or maybe, maybe you might have a camel or a mule. It would have been easy for them to say, you know what, Jerusalem, mind your own business. You do whatever you're doing in Jerusalem. We're going to do whatever we're doing here in Antioch. And, you know, quite frankly, we just don't need to talk to each other. That wouldn't have been good for the church. The Jews were very concerned that if the Gentiles keep growing the way they're growing and they don't have to follow Jewish tradition, that will be the end of Judaism. We might as well close the synagogues. If they can come to saving faith without having to adhere to the Mosaic law and without being circumcised, then what's going to become of the Jewish tradition? We have to preserve this, otherwise it dies out. They were making some very passionate arguments. The Gentiles were simply saying, here's what I know. This word has resonated with my heart, and this word has transformed me in a way that nothing I've ever heard and nothing I've ever seen, and I have to respond to that truth. I know nothing else other than Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. This is what I know. And they embraced it. Number one, admit there's a problem. Don't ignore it. Number two, this delegation went to Jerusalem. Why? Talk to the elders. To talk to the apostles. My study has not revealed to me that every apostle was there, but we know some were. And so they were going to those that knew Jesus best to seek counsel on this issue. When you're in conflict, to whom is it that you run to for advice and counsel? Judge Judy? Your cousin, Pookie? Or are you your own counsel? You don't talk to anybody about it. You just keep it to yourself. Number one, admit there's a problem. Don't ignore it. Number two, seek godly counsel. Number three, include, don't exclude. You'll notice in the passage that it says, and this is towards the end, the entire church is listening to Peter. We had the elders come together, and they presented this issue now to the entire congregation, and the entire congregation hears Peter's wonderful explanation. All the cards were out in the open. Nothing to hide. Nothing to be ashamed of. Presenting this with the confidence that we can receive an answer from God regarding the conflict. Include. Don't exclude. Number four, allow others to express themselves. Now this is hard to do sometimes, but we see Peter did it. The text tells us it was only after much debate that Peter stood up. Well, wait a minute. Peter could have literally nipped this in the bud, pun fully intended, because he had a revelation directly from God. God had told him that the Gentiles were to be grafted in and a part of the family of God. Why then would he listen to all of this discussion when he could have stood up simply and said, we don't need to hear that. God's already spoken on this issue. You can hush that stuff up. We learn. When you're in conflict, we don't lose anything by listening and understanding. He heard him out. Number five, when you're in conflict, what does God say? At the end of the day, that's really what's important. Peter did not call attention to his rank. <coughs> or the one is holding the very unique and high office of apostle. Nor did he point to his leadership role in the church at the day of Pentecost. He didn't talk about the 3,000 people that came to saving faith. It doesn't matter about tradition and ritual and what others say. What does matter is what does God have to say. And on this, 
He says, God has spoken very clearly. Let's look at the text. <coughs> Pardon me. Brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by the mouth, by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. And God, he, made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of these people that neither you nor our fathers were able to bear? And here it is. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ just as they will. What does God have to say about it? Six, you're in conflict, you've got to be obedient to what God commands. It was God that chose the Gentiles. It was God who knew their heart. It was God who made no distinction. It was God who told them to go and preach the gospel. It was God who enabled them. We need to be obedient to what God tells us to do. When God says, don't provoke your children to wrath, we need to be obedient to that. When God says to love your wife as Christ loved the church, we need to be obedient to that. When God says to speak words of love and grace and affirmation, to speak the truth in love, we need to be obedient to that. When he says seek peace, we need to be obedient to that. Seven. There's a time to listen, and there's a time to speak. And we need the enabling power of the Holy Spirit to know when and where and what to say. We live now in an age of instant judgment. Instant opinions with little regard for prayer and meditation and reflecting and seeking God's face. Almost on a daily basis, we're invited to judge, make decisions, evaluate, criticize, look at the conduct and the deeds and the speech of others, and we do so with so much shouting. And so oftentimes the dialogue begins with, I think, I believe. I feel this way. Seems to me, and the clamor of conflict is almost deafening, name calling, black against white, young against old, Democrat against Republicans. We can find so many things to be against and against and against and against. But beloved, when it comes down to it, all the distinctions that the world would toss at us to distract us from the truth of the gospel, people fall into just one of two categories. You're either saved or you're lost. Praise God. He loves us. He chose us. He makes no distinction between Jew or Gentile. And God has provided the way for humanity, for you and for me, to be reconciled to this holy God. Now, you got to hear me on this. Church attendance won't save you. Praise God you're here tonight, but coming to the Sunday evening gathering is not going to save you. Singing in the choir, praise God, is not going to save you. Volunteering at Awana, we're so glad you do, but that's not going to save you. Putting money in the offering, Bertie's not going to like this, is not going to save you. <laughs> Beloved, there is no saving power in anything but the cross of Christ. There is no saving power in anything but the cross of Christ. 
You and I have not received a watered-down version of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that was confirming the gospel to those saints in 48 AD is the same identical Holy Spirit that indwells us today. The same God who called the Gentiles and the Jews in 48 AD is the same God who is calling us in 2017. Jesus, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, we don't need anything other than Jesus. All you need is Jesus. And aren't you glad about that? Aren't you encouraged by that? You don't have to stop doing anything. Let Jesus take care of that. You don't have to pay off your debts. Jesus will help you with that. All you need to do is acknowledge the truth of the gospel. We are faced with only two choices here. This is either the greatest lie that was ever told, or it's absolutely true. All of history confirms that what's written in this book is true. When the scholars and the historians said, no, that can't be true, there was no such title. It was in the book. It was true. And when they unearthed it, they found out. How could he have known that? Because he was an eyewitness to it. See, I don't think you could pull off a lie like this. People were dying. All they had to do was say, I didn't see him. I, I, nope, I wasn't there. I didn't, I didn't see him. But they were willing to die. You remember the movie Roots? Remember yes. that? Yes. They wanted to change that slave boy. Kunta Kente changed his name to Toby. He didn't want to be Toby. His name was Kunta Kente, and so they stretched him out, and they got a whip, and they beat him half to death until he would change his name to Toby. Now, I don't know about you, but if that had been me, they wouldn't have to bring any whip out. <laughs> if they just threatened it. it was, well, hey, 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 my name's Toby. <laughs> I come from a long line of Tobys. Toby, 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 banana, fanna, Toby. What you want me to fetch, master? They wouldn't have had to hit me one time. My point is, they're beating people. They're killing people. And all they got to say is, you're right. We made the whole thing up. And they wouldn't do it. Why? Because it's true. Jesus came. He healed all manner of diseases. People who never walked, walked. People who have never seen, saw. And he went to Calvary so that God could measure out the full measure of his wrath on him to pay for my sins. So when God looked at Jesus, he looked at Jesus as though he had lived my life. But now, praise God, God looks at me as though I'd lived Jesus' life. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, and that is available to everyone who would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the truth, beloved. Will we have conflict? Yeah, we will. But God provides wisdom and grace and abundance. And if we would but be obedient to what he'd ask us to do, we'll grow We'll encourage one another. We'll heal. And we'll be stronger together. Father, I've said now what you'd have me to say. There may be some here, here tonight, and they're neck deep in conflict. Would you go before them now as they are obedient to what we have discussed. 
Prepare hearts even now. And make way for peace. I pray within the body here, this place we call the Moody Church, that we will love one another, be kind and tender-hearted to one another, that we will encourage one another. Now, Lord, there may be someone here who has never accepted you as Savior and Lord. But you're calling. And you've given them the ability right now to understand this truth and to know that they need a Savior. Do what only you can do now, Father. Convict. Call. Save. I commit you to him, Lord. In the matchless and comparable name of Jesus. And amen. God bless you.